121, and I think you will need your Bible open there this morning as we seek God's Word from this psalm together. It's the second, you may have noticed as we were reading, of a group of 15 psalms which you will find are called Songs of Ascent in the Revised Standard Version. If you have an authorized version, they are called Songs of Degrees. The title literally means a song of steps, and it seems to refer to the steps of the pilgrim on his way to Jerusalem. It may be this pilgrim association which has made these psalms so relevant to so many people in days of crisis or new beginnings as they feel they are setting out on a new course in life or when new, some new challenge arises. They certainly underline these 15 psalms associated with the pilgrimage of God's people to Jerusalem. The fact that man is a pilgrim, that life does not stand still for him and that the opening of a new year and of a new decade, that's something that is pressed upon us with a new sense of reality. That the years are passing away, that time like a never rolling stream bears all its suns away and we are carried along with the passage of time. We are not in this world forever. And it is an important thing to remind ourselves of as we come to such an occasion as this. New years are artificial things in some ways, but God can use them to remind us of some of the great issues that undergird our lives, that we are not here in this world forever. We are pilgrims. We are on a journey. Whether we want to be or not, time is moving on. And we are impressed by the brevity of life at such times as these. And a new decade ushers in days of new challenge and new hopes, new joys and new sorrows for many of us, new prospects and new disappointments, new hopes and new fears. Now the burning question in facing the unknown future is the question the psalmist spells out so simply in verse 1. From whence does my help come? It is a very real thing for us to face the unknown and the uncertainties of life and the realities of this world in which we live with all its crises in these days. And the psalmist is asking the question as he faces the realities of life, from whence does my help come? I'm sure it would be unnecessary to point out to you that that is a question, and not as in the authorized version, a statement. Both the authorized version and the metrical version of the Psalter have done us quite a mischief here. And I am, of course, a great supporter both of the authorized version and of the Psalter in its metrical form. But they have really done us a mischief in this. They have made it seem as if the psalmist is saying that his help comes from the hills. I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence doth come mine aid. But of course the psalmist's help does not come from the hills. What he is saying is precisely not that. He looks to the hills as he makes his journey to Jerusalem, his eyes lifted up because Jerusalem was some 2,300 feet above sea level. And he lifts up his eyes to the hills of southern Judea as he makes his way towards the city and his heart begins to beat with anticipation at the thought of marching to Zion. That's what this man finds his whole soul rising up with. And these psalms beat with this knot. He was looking in the right direction. Of course, he had his eyes set towards the city of God. He was marching towards Jerusalem. And you and I need that at the beginning of this new year and this new decade. Because that is where we are journeying to if we are God's people this morning. If you are a true Christian today, that is what your pilgrimage is all about. 
we are marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And that's what our life is about, beloved. That's what the passing years signify. One year nearer to glory. That's what the new year means. And it's so important for God's people to have this sense of a vision. This upward look that the psalmist had as he marched towards Jerusalem. Do you have that this morning? Is that the significance of the years rolling away and time bearing its sons on? It's bearing you on to glory. We need the sense of direction in our lives that makes it apparent that we are looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. But you see, we need more. We need to discover where we will find the resources and the strength to make that pilgrimage from grace to glory. Is that not really what is the deepest longing in the hearts of so many of us in church this morning? Isn't that what so many of us long to know? Where will we find the resources for the pilgrimage that lies before us? Because for so many people there are so many bewildering things that lie before us as we look into this new year. All of us face a future in a world that is groaning with crises and problems this morning, and it is no part of Christian faith to be unrealistic about the world or about the life to which God has set us. We live in a world that's fraught with international problems, with whole areas of the world at flashpoint this very morning. Our dear friends have come back from Afghanistan where there is a whole cauldron of possibilities today. Iran immediately next door is an area which is creating tension throughout the whole of the world. The whole of southern Africa, southeast Asia, And perhaps one of our biggest crises is the lack of men of stature in places of leadership and the world scene. Somebody was saying the other day, what is it that is going to happen to the world if a man becomes the President of the United States whose moral fiber failed in a crisis? Now what happens without entering into the politics of it? What happens if such a man is faced with a crisis and his moral fiber fails and he puts his finger on the wrong button? We live in a world that's fraught with crisis. We live in a world that's fraught with economic crises on a world scale. A financial editor of the London Times wrote the other day that in the 1980s every stock exchange in the Western world will feel that it has a potential earthquake underneath it. Where is their security? And there are personal problems and they may be the more immediate, the ordinary problems of daily life and of Christian discipleship the particular challenges that some of us face, the uncertainties. For some of us, the heartaches and agonies that this year may well bring. I say to you again, my dear friends, the Bible is not unrealistic about the future, nor does it lead us into a world of make-believe and pretense. And there are the ongoing ordinary problems, the problems of being young. And God knows there are all sorts of problems about being young. And the problems of being old and the problems of being neither, but just middle-aged. And there are many problems 
about being middle-aged. The problems, the challenges, the opportunities, the joys and prospects that the future holds, the longings that are in our souls this morning, and the great question, how are we going to make this pilgrimage? And out of these there is brought this cry, from whence does my help come? Now the point of this psalm is just to focus the answer to this question. And the answer is clear and unequivocal in verse 2 at the beginning. My help comes from the Lord. And the rest of the psalm is just a series of affirmations and assurances about the Lord as the source of every kind of grace and help that any of us will ever need through the days that lie before us. What the psalmist is doing is affirming the truths that are caught up in that one phrase, my help comes from the Lord. And the man who has that anchor to his soul can face any kind of storm, any kind of future. And what the psalmist really focuses on is upon God as his helper in four ways. First, as the God of creation. In the first part of the psalm, you will notice in the RSV, it's really divided into what looked like four stanzas, and it may have been that kind of stanza, and it may have been that God's people sang part of it to each other as they moved towards Jerusalem my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then you can hear the antiphonal singing of another company. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And the others, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. What a way to march to glory with God's people, encouraging one another like this. But the focus is on God first as the God of creation. Secondly, on God as the God of history in verses 3 and 4. Then God as the God of the individual in verses 5 and 6. And God as the God of all the ages in verses 7 and 8. Look with me at the God of creation, who is the source of the psalmist's help. It's very significant, you know, that whenever God's children in Scripture face the unknown and feel unfit and unprepared and inadequate, it's so often to the doctrine of God as creator that they turn in their weakness. You get it several times in these psalms of pilgrimage. Here in Psalm 121 at verse 2, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And in Psalm 124 at verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And in Psalm 134 at verse 3, May the Lord bless you from Zion, He who made heaven and earth. And if you go through the scriptures, you will discover this is how God's people cry to Him and come to know Him and rest their confidence in Him. This is how the apostles pray, for example, in the great prayer of Acts chapter 4, Sovereign Lord, they cry to him. When they are in a day of great crisis in the history of the early church, Sovereign Lord, who didst make the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And they are beseeching God as Ezra does in Nehemiah 9, as Jehoshaphat does as he is faced with the crisis in 2 Chronicles 20, throughout the whole of Scripture, they beseech God as the God of creation. And the reason they do this, of course, is that God uses this very plea to persuade us to believe in his adequacy and sufficiency. Have you noticed this beautiful dual way in which the doctrine of creation is used? First, God uses it to persuade his people to trust him. Look, for example, at Isaiah 40, or listen to it if you can't get it in time. Listen to this. Here is God speaking to his weak, fearful people in Babylon. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint because he is the creator. And so God's people take up this plea and they beseech him, O oh God who has created the ends of the earth. And the psalmist cries to him as the God who made heaven and earth. He is the God of creation and the help the psalmist needs comes from this vast, vast resource. That's what the created order should do for us. You see, it should expand our faith and enable us to trust in God for the small details of our daily lives. If he is the one who set the hills in their place, and who formed the stars and put them on their course, is he not able to do for you the lesser thing? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. But he is not only the God of creation, he is the God of history. That's really the point of verse 4 when the psalmist cries, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber because he is the God who has kept Israel. Now some scholars think that these psalms were either composed or at least sung in the days when Israel re was returning from the exile in Babylon. Whether that is so or not, the psalmist is certainly reviewing God's keeping power over his people in history. And you will notice how others of these songs of ascent have the same keynote. Psalm 124, for example, is just an extension of the same idea of God in history as the God in whom his people put their trust. They look back, for example, in Psalm 124, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive when their anger was kindled against us. The flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. And the same in Psalm 126. They look back upon God's mercy, his sovereign goodness to his people in the past. And, and they cry, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Now it is this glorious significance of the God who is the God of history that brings hope into the psalmist's heart, do you see? And this is what ought to bring hope into our hearts this morning. This is why God introduces himself to his people in these terms. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now the point of that history lesson is, you see, if I have done that in the past, can you not trust me today? And this is the point of the great areas of history in the Bible. History in Scripture is not some dull irrelevance. History in Scripture is given us by God that we might learn what he is like and see his ways with his children and cry to him, Lord, 
do the same thing for me in my day. He is the God of history. And that's the significance of history for God's people. That leads me on to the third thing. He is the God of creation. He is the God of history. But he is also the God of the individual. Because this mighty keeping power which is evident in history and revealed in creation is not a vague or general kind of thing. It's not an abstract idea to which we subscribe. It is intended to be a living personal experience not available just to a few of God's people but addressed specifically to you. In verses 5 to 7 the you is singular as the authorized version brings out the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade on thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. It is addressed specifically and personally to you. And do you notice how God is so anxious to personalize this? The Lord is a keeper to give you security. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord himself is your keeper. In traveling in the Holy Land in these days, I understand that they had to provide guards who would keep them secure. But the trouble was that there were occasions when the guards were foolish and the guide didn't know the way or when during the night they were inclined to be lazy and dropped off to sleep. And what the psalmist is saying is the Lord is the perfect guardian and keeper of his people, a protection from the sun by day and from the moon by night. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? We all are aware of the dangers of the sun by day, of sunstroke. But what about moonstroke? Well, of course, to the ancients, that was a very real thing. And it's not so stupid in many ways, because it does seem as if the movement of the moon affects the minds of people, whence the word lunacy. But perhaps what he is speaking about is this, that God's people are often most vulnerable during the night. Isn't that so? Don't mole hills become mountains if you are awake in the middle of the night and you discover that things that you might normally cope with all right during the day become magnified a hundredfold during the night and all must make you demented. Could he be speaking about fears that are real and fears that are just imaginary? But whatever they are, the Lord is a shade and a keeper to his people. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. And the secret of the pilgrimage is a humble trust in a personal sense in such a God for every need and every peril. There's a beautiful illustration of this over in Psalm 131 in one of these same songs of ascent. Do you notice how the psalmist is speaking about the way he has trusted himself to the Lord so personally in the kind of language that we might scarcely use? O oh Lord, who says my heart is not lifted up? He is not proud. 
My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a child quieted at its mother's breast, like a child that is quieted is my soul. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. That's the personal dimension in which God is the God of the individual. That's a very individual and a very personal picture. And yet, my beloved, it is the language God uses to describe to us how he longs to take us to us as children and to succor us like this in a personal, individual sense as though there was not another soul in the universe except you. Do you know how some people have the gift of giving themselves wholly to you and their attention to you so that as some have said to me, you would think that there had been nobody else in the world except me for him at that moment. Now that's just a faint reflection of what is in the heart of God for his needy children as he seeks to draw us to himself and enable us to calm and quiet our soul. So the appeal, O Israel, hope in the Lord, and that whatever the future may hold, you notice how the promise in verse 7 is, the Lord will keep you from all evil. And in the light of the facts of everyday life, and in the light of the rest of Scripture, we have to understand how God keeps us from evil. He certainly does not insulate us from evil things, or evil experiences or occurrences. But what he does is to take you into his arms and to keep your soul and to turn every apparent tragedy into good for his glory. So that you are able to say, all things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purpose. Everything, the things that are dark and awful, the things that are joyful and glorious, the whole pattern God takes and weaves into his purpose. My dear Christian brother or sister, can you really believe that this morning? Can you really believe what the psalmist in Psalm 125 says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. And as you cannot get into Jerusalem apart from through the mountains, so nothing can touch the child of God apart from the protection of God. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. He is the God of creation and the God of history and the God of the individual. And the last thing in a word is that he is the God of all the ages 
The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. That's another great phrase of these psalms. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from this time forth and forevermore. It is speaking of God's eternity, you see. My dear friends, the glorious thing about God is just this. We sometimes are misled when we think of God's personality in terms of the only other personality we know, which is our own. And we think of him as being a person rather like ourselves. But you see, the thing about us is that the years do change us. The years change us in all sorts of ways. We haven't seen each other for a long time when we say, my, what a difference there is in you. Or you see somebody when the weather is bad and you see a difference in them. Or when circumstances are adverse and they are crotchety and difficult. When they are sick and they have got some problem and they are cast down. We change with changing times. But God never changes. The years do not change him. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time henceforth and even forevermore. And that is one thing, perhaps the one thing in the whole world that you and I can be assured of at the beginning of this year. That God will abide the same. Therefore, let Israel hope in the Lord and let us put our trust in him. Let us pray. We come to thee, our gracious Father, and bless thee for all that thou art as our creator, as the Lord of history, as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we cast ourselves afresh upon thee this morning and look to thee for all our needs in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen.